we're presenting yeah great all right we're now live okay thanks for joining everyone we've we're um, people are slowly coming in um, um you can see the um presenters for today and we'll start very very shortly uh, once once uh, people have gathered see the numbers shooting up it's good to see andrew smith back in the room thanks for joining Okay, people are still joining, but we've got a packed schedule, so I am going to get going. You can see the, the presenters here um, joining us today. Um, thanks for joining us and welcome to this second WADSCON. Um, it's a little bit different to probably anything you've done before, uh, before or, or during COVID. Um, it's fast, fast paced uh, learning and development experience, or at least that's my goal. Um, I'm hoping you will be teased with a range of topics that excite you to go and explore um, further. We've got four amazing speakers, so they're all going to speak for five minutes or so, followed by a, a Q&A. Um, it's uh, that they've all responded brilliantly to the challenge, although a couple of flex the rules of three slides, but we'll forgive them that uh, because this really is a brutal level of abs abstraction as a, as a format for a, an event. Um, if you've got questions, a bit of housekeeping, post them in the chat or head to Twitter, use the hashtag WADSCON. Um, in the feedback from the session in February, you asked for more on research data and insights. So we have responded and we've got sessions from David, Stella, and as you can see, uh, and Garrett. Uh, we've also got a, a session from Corey on the state of the PR market. So without further ado, we're gonna crack on. The first up is an incredible individual, David Talbot. He's the founder of a company called Sticky, Sticky Beak. Uh, he also runs polling research and strategy for New Zealand's prime minister. Uh, he joins us at 2 a.m. in the morning from, from Wellington. David, when our mutual friend um, pitched you for this slot, I didn't think you'd, you'd accept, but incredible that you did. And thank you for joining us. Um, please, it, the, flo the floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much. And um, yeah, thanks for having me even um, at this for me um, kind of late hour. Hopefully you've got a screen share from me now. Brilliant. All right. So Sticky Beak um, is a tech startup. Um, it's a research platform with a really different, we think, unique approach to uncovering insights. Um, my background is in traditional uh, market research. I used to start these kinds of um, presentations by describing myself as a political pollster. Uh, but quickly discovered that that tended to decrease my credibility as a speaker rather than to raise it. Um, so stopped doing that. Um, the main reason was that at the time, um, what was sometimes seen as a series of fairly high profile um, polling failures had really rocked confidence in the polling industry. And the two most prominent I've pictured here were Brexit on the left and Trump's election on the right. Um, and these failures were part of what started me and some of my colleagues thinking about what the future of quantitative research might look like. The first challenge that we faced was really getting clear about what the problems were with traditional research uh, before we got into the business of, of trying to solve them. And the first problem um, I've called engagement. Um, I spend a lot of time uh, running focus groups. Um, and when people leave my focus groups, um, they usually can't wait to come back. They've sat there for an hour and a half and talked about you know, their lives and things they care about. Um, it struck me as odd that nobody ever, ever uh, says the same thing about a quantitative survey. Um, quantitative surveys are typically pretty awful um, and they can feel to a lot of people like interrogations. Um, I'm probably guilty myself of writing the odd survey like that, but I just don't imagine that that kind of interaction with customers and stakeholders and the public 
um, is, can be, and is the future of um, quantitative research. Um, the second problem, um, reaching audiences, finding the right audience, often remarkably difficult using traditional panel providers to get to niche audiences. Um, and increasingly, a lot of the work that you and people you work with will be doing is about finding just the right people to talk to that you're then marketing to um, or communicating with. Um, so underrepresentation um, is one of the big problems and I think one of the underlying causes of those polling errors that I talked about just briefly at the start. Um, most panels, though, have not so much problem getting to a general public sample, uh, but if you want to talk to a, a special audience, like an ethical consumer, uh, maybe people who are interested in bird watching or sneaker collecting, that's a huge, huge challenge for a traditional research methodology. And the last one, probably familiar to you, um, if you've ever commissioned research, is the cost. Um, specifically, high cost, slow time frames um, when you're dealing with traditional research agencies. Wouldn't it be great, we thought, um, if we could bring that cost right down and just democratize the whole process a bit. Um, so here's how Sticky Beak's doing things differently. Um, on engagement, we encourage conversations rather than those interrogations. Um, surveys on our platform are written conversationally. They're deployed um, in a chat interface very highly familiar to respondents and very highly engaging. So vi visual, fun and interactive is the way we've decided to do the engagement piece. Um, on the audience piece, instead of relying on panels of professional survey takers, we recruit fresh um, audiences from Facebook and Instagram for every survey. And here you can be as specific as you like about who it is that you want to talk to. Um, ages, geography, and of course, interests, which is the really exciting one. That might be job seekers, it might be shopaholics, it might be football fans, it might be geocachers. Really, there's almost no limit. If it can be found on social, you can target it via our platform. Hugely powerful opportunity to understand niche segments. And finally, um, on cost. Um, the cost acquisition of these niches is typically fairly low. Um, and because it's a do-it-yourself platform, there aren't big agency overheads either. So the bulk of um, research run on our platform is just the kind of in the hundreds of dollars rather than in the thousands or tens of thousands. So um, much, much lower costs. Um, we're still in beta um, in a lot of ways just getting started. Um, I think the next big shift could be around the move from text interfaces to voice interfaces. Um, and we've built Sticky Beak on top of Google's Dialogflow platform just to leave open um, that opportunity. Um, I guess in the hope that tomorrow's research might involve uh, robots sounding like people uh, rather than people sounding like robots. Um, so uh, that's all in terms of my kind of substantive presentation, but please go to the website, have a poke around. We've exposed the targeting um, piece of the platform there so you can play to your heart's content, whether it is sneaker lovers or geocachers or football moms that you're after, uh, they're all there to be talked to and interviewed. Sorry, thanks. Thank you very much, David. Um, Anyone in the audience, if you've got questions for David, please drop them into the uh, into the chat, uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll put them to him. Um, David, a couple of things: um, how, uh, as an agency, do you deploy um, a a survey on on the platform? How quick does it take? We built it so that um, almost anybody can do it. In the back of my mind, always I always wanted my mother to be able to sort of run these surveys for her book club. And my kind of starting point was that if she couldn't get a survey out in 10 or 15 minutes, we hadn't done our job. Um, so it's a fully do-it-yourself platform. You literally just kind of sign up for a free account. Um, you pop in some questions the way you'd expect to. Um, you get another window, which um, allows you to simply specify your targeting. And then from there, it's literally just a credit card and a single button to launch it. So very quick process start to finish. Um, and a lot of people will see um, research uh, results rolling in within kind of minutes. Um, I, I, well, that was my next question. How long does it take, typically take to get results back from a survey? It depends who you're after. If you're after sneaker collectors and geocaches, um, those audiences will typically be quite small. Um, and you might expect a survey of 100 or 200 of those people to take you know, kind of in the region of three to five days would be my guess. Um, for general public audiences, it's typically a lot faster. But what we're finding is that once people understand the kinds of niches they can get access to, that's the bit that really excites them. Um, and so at that point, it's about probably 
um, not always speed, but talking to people that they've never been able to manage to survey before. Uh, questions for, from Andy Smith, who was a presenter last time. How does it compare with something like a Google survey, or something that you hand code? Um, it's it's you still kind of hand code it, so it's not um, it's not kind of AI generated natural language processing. So it's presented in a chat window, which different, differentiates it from, I think, most of the other kind of platforms out there. And we think that's part of what makes it really engaging and a really good fit, particularly for kind of brand research and things where there's um, often a kind of a, um, a relationship piece between the client and the respondents. Um, but in, in some ways, technically quite similar to the kind of um, thing that Google's been doing, very short surveys, um, quite tight um, and deployed to these, these niche audiences. But what really sets us apart, we think, is the social targeting and the conversational aspect of it. So two similar questions to, to follow up from Sarah Nelson and Anne Gregory. Um, what if an audience isn't on Facebook or Insta? And have you any plans to go beyond those? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've been talking about where we go next right from the start, but there's just so many millions or billions of people between those two platforms that that's what really made sense to us. Um, there are There is the um, opportunity inside the product to generate a link to your survey, which can then be shared on Twitter or LinkedIn or other platforms that you see fit. It's just that that doesn't connect to the social targeting that's built into Sticky Beak. Um, the way it does on Facebook and Instagram. So you can still do it. Um, we are still thinking about it. And if you've got good ideas, um, certainly send them my way. As I say, we're in beta and we're looking for, you know, ways to improve the product in, in ways that um, users find useful. That's great. Thank you. Um, question about open and uh, answered, uh, so for uh, open and uh, open ended questions and, and open ended answers. Can it handle that? Presumably it's a chat interface. So yes. Yeah. People can type things in, but one of the kind of things that we discovered very quickly is that people don't like doing it. Um, and I knew that from traditional market research, but those people were professional respondents and I trained them to do it essentially. Um, with untrained respondents who are fresh and bring kind of in lots of ways, I think a unique kind of um, opportunity to a research piece like this, it's very important to keep the surveys simple. And part of that is wherever you can coding your answers. So they're picking between a list of names of fruit rather than trying to think what their favorite one was. So we encourage people um, in the interface to kind of keep it simple, um, to make choices binary where they can. Um, and at most probably five choices, if you can get it down to that um, sort of discipline, um, you know, and go from there, but it can certainly handle it. We just, we, um, if you can find another way, that's our recommendation. So, so can you get Margaret Doherty is asked, can you give us an example of a use case? Um, granted, you didn't have time to present a, a presentation, show a, a case study, but you know, how might a customer agency typically use it? So um, it's being used in lots of different ways. One of our kind of foundation clients is Dole International Foods, who some of you will know as kind of pineapples and bananas. Um, they've done everything from kind of um, talking to ethically conscious consumers about different packaging choices. Um, they've done, they've tested different labels and packaging options against each other on the platform. Um, and sometimes they've just tested ideas. And what they're finding is that instead of spending 10 or 20 or $30,000 on a really full blown research project that has three decimal places after every answer, often what they're trying to re replicate or to bolster is the kind of decision making that happens around a boardroom table with five staff just deciding they like package A better than package B. And what they find here is that for a few hundred dollars, they can you know, test some of those assumptions. Some of them turn out to be right. Some of them turn out to be wrong, but it can allow them to work in that really kind of agile way that's um, adding value. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I, I want to thank you, David, for, for your time, especially for, again, I'm going to reiterate, it's amazing you staying up to two o'clock in the morning. Uh, but also I think we, we've, as public relations practitioners, we've been looking on to uh, New Zealand and the way um, your prime minister's handled the, the communication with the, the, the public and also the wider, um, the wider uh, response to COVID with, you know, with some MB as you know, clearly um, you seem to have got it right. And so, you know, thank you for that. Um, it's a pleasure, thanks for having me. All right, you 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 can go off to bed. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of it. Cheers.
Okay, so uh, yes, yeah, so, sorry, uh, Jacinda Hearn, of course, the Prime Minister of um, New Zealand is a public relations graduate. Um, and again, thanks there to, to, to David. David's his, her, um, her strategist. Um, so next up, we have Corey, um, Corey Kamgos, whose career has followed um, the um, public relations uh, industry uh, associations. Now he's a director of communications at, um, at uh, the PRCA. Uh, Corey, do you want to stick your camera on? Are you there? Sure, yeah. Can you see me? Yeah, you're here. Right? Right, cool. I will just try and share my screen. Bear with Thanks, me. Good. So Corey and I have had numerous conversations about the state of the PR market during uh, during COVID. Uh, and you've got some stories to tell about how you think the future, inevitably, you're in PR is, is good, right? Absolutely, yeah. So can you see my screen all right? Yeah, sound data. That's great. Thank you. Cool. Thanks very much for that word. And hi, everyone. As was said, I'm Corey Kamgos. I'm the Director of Communications and Marketing at the PRCA. And I'm going to speak today about the impact of the pandemic in general and what it means for the profession going forward. So just a little bit about me to begin with, as was mentioned, um, I've spent quite a bit of time working with industry bodies. I graduated uh, in English back in 2008 at the heart of what I thought was a really deep and prolonged recession. Um, there were very few jobs available in PR, so I went back to uni. I did a master's in media and comms at Brunel. And I landed my first proper role in PR working for an agency in New York before moving back to London to join the CIPR, where I worked in policy and then PR. And while I was there, I studied a diploma. I became a chartered practitioner. And about a year and a half ago, I joined the PRCA. So as Wad said, I've spent much of my career trumpeting the value of PR. So I make no apologies in advance for talking up the importance of what we do. So we're now uh, certainly in the UK, almost a year to the day since lockdown measures were imposed. And it's really quite difficult to quantify just how much has changed within that space of time. So if we cast our minds back to this time last year, the PR industry was relatively fresh from celebrating a decade of uninterrupted growth. So the industry was valued at 14.9 billion pounds. And we don't yet have the comparative figures to assess the industry size as it is now, but we do know that the pandemic delivered a hammer blow to that growth. So uh, a couple of bits of research that, that we've put together, you can see that 50% of PR agencies and in-house teams sadly had to make redundancies in 2020, and similarly 60% made use of the furlough scheme. But despite those macro challenges, the global industry has shown remarkable resilience uh, over the past 12 months. Certainly if you look at the PR operations uh, within large holding firms like Omnicom and WPP, PR has consistently outperformed creative disciplines that tend to command larger budgets. That's not to say operations aren't down year on year. They are, just not to the extent um, as other creative industries such as advertising, for example. So it's fair to say that the respect that business leaders hold for PR has grown considerably over this time. So if we fast forward to the present day, one year on from lockdown, yes, there are significant challenges ahead, but confidence is returning. Globally, at the start of the year, as many of half of our members were recruiting again, which is great news. And throughout the past 12 months, we've run confidence tracker surveys regularly to gauge levels of optimism throughout the industry. And just to give you an indication of how those have gone, the first one that we ran in March 2020, just 54% of agency and in-house leaders said that they were confident about the future of their organization. And the last one that we ran uh, just a few weeks ago showed that that figure had risen to 93%. And it's a similar picture across the world in our global regions as well. So 84% in Southeast Asia, 84% in Middle East and North Africa, although still slightly lower in Latin America at 54%. So why has the industry performed so well during this time? I don't think it really matters what sector you work in. Uh, the pandemic has taught organizations, brands, governments, a really harsh lesson in the importance of understanding how actions impact their stakeholders and in turn their, their reputation and having people inside your organization who can provide context and bring in internal and external perspectives into the decision making process and mediate those against the businesses I think is absolutely critical but personally what I have found most um, fascinating about this period is the widespread acceptance of the importance of communication. Now uh, um, I've got this graphic up on the screen here and I'm probably not the only one to have heard the phrase it's PR not ER. Um, and as someone who's dedicated a fair chunk of their career to 
championing the value of our industry and our practice. I've always found that phrase slightly irritating, if I'm being honest, because it almost reinforces that stereotype of, of PR as superficial and unimportant. But I do feel as though the last, over the last 12 months, that perception is beginning to change. And I'll, sh I'll share an example of why. I remember shortly after the pandemic was declared uh, this time last year, I was listening to the Today program on Radio 4. And the headline item of that uh, segment was on government communication strategy. And they had people on guests dissecting the efficacy of government communications and linking it to rates of transmission. And I just found that absolutely fascinating because all of a sudden communications was now having a real impact on the number of people who were unfortunately losing their lives. So it, was, it had largely become a matter of life and death. So it's clear that the pandemic has certainly accelerated uh, the respect that business leaders and, and society at large hold, hold for what we do. And we've got the data to back that up as well. So we polled large FTSE listed companies last summer 71% of them said that they uh, had PR represented at board level and 63% said that they that PR played a key role in developing the organization's COVID strategy. So again, positive signs that attitudes are shifting. Another reason I think PR has been so resilient during this time is because a huge amount of societal change has occurred in a really short space of time. And as part of that, public expectations on brands and organizations, certainly in Western markets has massively intensified. The businesses now need to demonstrate tangible action on the issues that people care about. And I'm sure we are all well aware that well-crafted statements, intentions, commitments no longer cut it. And if 2020 taught us anything, it's that people won't tolerate empty promises, which I think presents PR with a massive opportunity because now we've got the, the, the power, if you like, to influence how a business acts as well as how it communicates. And there's a great quote here from Andy Farrow, who's the Vice President of Corporate Affairs and Sustainability at Mars. So they're the company behind brands like Uncle Ben's, Dove, m and And he was speaking at our virtual international summit last year. And he said that communication can never be words alone. And I just think that's a really powerful and succinct way of summarizing both our opportunity as practitioners, but, but our responsibility as well. And if you think about it, that kind of strikes to the heart of what public relations practice has always been about. It's been about establishing dialogue, developing trust and building relationships between an organization and its public, not the public, an organization's public. It's the groups of people that it interacts with, its employees, its customers, its suppliers. So in many ways, this crisis has really helped the practice return to its roots and served as a reminder of what we're capable of. So in conclusion, yes, it's been a year of pain, um, but it's also been one in which the industry has emerged with a tremendous amount of credit as a strategic management discipline. And the simple truth is that public relations and communications has never been more relevant to business and to society. Thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, so do you want to come back onto camera? Sure. Great, what a great presentation. Uh, a couple of people asking about that date, the day, various data that you, you shared. Uh, where can we go and find that? So there were a few data sets in there. So the confidence tracker, um, is on the PRCA website. So we've run probably about uh, eight of those in total over the past 12 months. Um, you can find, so you can just, if you Google PRCA confidence tracker, you should be able to find it. Um, also the other bit of research that I referred to uh, about uh, how business leaders view PR was something that we published as part of our Power of PR campaign. So again, if you, if you uh, just Google PRCA Power of PR, um, in the press release there, there's some, some data sets that, that um, I'd be happy to share. Similarly, if, if anyone needs any more information, just feel free to uh, connect with me on social and I can point you in the right direction. Um, so I'd also say Provoke Media have done some great work uh, through the crisis, characterising the, the, uh, characterizing the, the impact of the crisis, uh, as has the Government Communication Service. Um, so those, those are great places to, to go and search uh, for information. CIPR itself and uh, the PRCA at the moment, you've both got surveys out into the field, haven't you? Looking at right. um, ongoing impacts. Um, you said 50% of, uh, of your members are, uh, are hiring at the moment, is that right? So that was in January, yeah. So we do um, engagement calls with, or, or members of our team hold engagement calls with members frequently. And at the beginning of the year, so in January, um, approximately 50% of them were hiring. Um, and I thought that that was fascinating because I remember when I, I joined the first edition of, of WODCON, 
last month and uh, Rohan was talking about how he felt that a lot of organizations had, had overcut early on. And as a result, there was a, there was a bit of a hiring boom in January. And he, I think one of the things he said that he predicted that that would die down eventually and, 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 and that arguably has happened, but there's certainly at the beginning of the year, there was, there was a boom in recruitment. Yeah, okay. We've actually got um, someone from uh, Alex from Ruben Sinclair joining us next month. Uh, so watch out for that to talk specifically about the opportunities for practitioners. Uh, Katrina, Mar Katrina Marshall, uh, Katrina has asked, uh, what can we best do to maintain the momentum and the newfound rep reputation that PR has? What's the PRCA doing? I think, it's a, I think it's a great question. And it's a really important one because I feel like now we've got, we've got, um, a newfound respect and credibility amongst business leaders, but it's about what we do with this. Uh, and I think uh, I heard someone say earlier that it's easier to, to prove yourself in a time of crisis and, and harder to do it uh, during a time of peace. But I think from our point of view, the, 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 what we need to do is be the best individual PR professionals that we can be. Um, and for me, that means making sure you're accountable. So you're signed up to a code of conduct, committing to qualifications, committing to CPD, and really doing everything that you can to boost your own professional knowledge, but also the credibility of the profession as well. And I think there is a movement and a shift taking place towards that transition. And the more people that can come on board with that, the better. So that would be my answer. Uh, <laughs> great call to action. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so opportunities emerging from the crisis. You kind of hinted about uh, ESG, I think, but you didn't actually say ESG, you've seen, seen that as a great, uh, sorry, as something that the PR team is uh, managing within organizations, yeah. Massively, I think that's, and, and I didn't get, I would have got into more detail if I, if I had the time, but I think it's, it's a huge, huge opportunity. And it's really important to bear in mind that when we talk about ESG and purpose, we're not talking about them as a, as a PR issue. They're not PR issues, they're called business issues, but they do present the profession with, with an amazing opportunity. I think a lot of the, the fear when the pandemic kicked off was that there was going to be a kind of a bit of a rethink about conscious capitalism and people were casting doubts over whether purpose-led comms would really be sustainable in the pandemic. But I think what we've seen is the opposite has happened. It's really emboldened and accelerated that trend. And um, I know that the S&P 500 um, do a, an ESG index. So they track how ESG um, investments compare with uh, their standard S&P 500. And, that over the first four months of the pandemic, the ESG index outperformed uh, the standard index. And it just shows that companies that subscribe to those values are seen as safer investments. Um, and, it, and, it, and I think that trend is, is likely to shoot on and on. Um, and as part of that, PR professionals have a really key, uh, really key opportunity to both tell the stories and actually help shape the organizations towards better behavior and performances for society. Do you, do you, sorry, do you think that is that as a result of COVID-19 or do you think are there are a number of factors there? Because, you know, we've been talking about CSR and for 20 years or so. What is it that's happened in this moment in time, do you think? I think so it's, it's certain, the crisis has certainly concentrated minds. But ultimately, I think what it's done is cut away a lot of the fat of organisations and it's forced organisations to really think hard about the value that they deliver. So um, that means for, for many organisations thinking about how their operations impact on their stakeholders. And I also alluded to the fact that um, customers and society at large have, have, certainly in Western markets, have higher expectations now. And I think all of those things combined mean that absolutely, yes, over the past 12 months, there's been a huge increase uh, in the focus of, of purpose-led comms and, and ESG. So I'd, I'd imagine that would, would continue for the foreseeable future, certainly. So, sorry, final question, and then I'll let you get back to Peppa Pig and childcare. Thanks <laughs> again. Thanks so much, Corey, for, for, for doing this. No, it's a pleasure. Um, do you, what, what's the danger, do you think, of, a, of us slipping back into our old ways? And Gregory has just asked this question. Uh, I, 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 you know, as we recover, um, yes, there's been massive change. There's been, you know, uh, investment in communications, investment organisations reaching out broader to society. You know, investing in in uh, in um, uh, the climate crisis to to address that. What's the danger that we all go back to reset? I mean, it is it is a really clear and present danger. Um, but look, that's up to us, isn't it? That's up to every every single one of us listening here, and, and to our colleagues as well, because we all take um, 
the actions that we take as individuals, and it goes back to what I said earlier about the commitments that we make, both to our industry and to our organization, about being accountable, uh, always learning and, and committing to qualifications and to, to continual improvement. I think if we continue along that path, then there's no, real, there's no ceiling for what, the, for what the industry can achieve. But of course, there is a real present danger that um, we lose this opportunity, but I'm an optimist, so I like to think that we'll seize it with both hands. Me too. Thanks so much, Corey. What a great way to end the presentation. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Um, Thanks very much. See you soon. Uh, so next up, we have Stella Bales. Stella, do you want to switch your camera on and come and say hello with you? Oh, there we go. Hi. So S Stella, I was trying to remember back to when we first met. I think it was uh, you were at Propellendet in Brighton, uh, thinking about building a SaaS business. Uh, and you invite a bunch of people onto a boat to oh, go yeah, and get, boat. Up, up, yeah. the Thames. Do you remember that? Yeah. And uh, and yeah. You see people like doing put a boat down the Thames. <laughs> yeah, we get... You actually made us work hard for lunch that day, though, didn't you? Uh, yeah. and, and what's the, this amazing business? So these two amazing businesses have resulted from those conversations six, seven years later, right? So, mm. comes to the public and coverage board. But you're going to talk to us about search listening. Yeah. So you to listen. Yes. Thank you for the intro. Uh, I need to share my screen, don't I? So yeah, hello everyone. Um, as Wad said, I am Stella and I work at Coverage Book and Answer the Public. But um, and also host a podcast called PR Resolution Podcast. So tune into that as well when you have time. End of plugs. But today, I'd quite like it's Friday. Um, I'd like to, us to play a game if you're up for it. Uh, so if you've got a drink, I think I saw Wads might have had a drink, actually. Have you got a drink? So if you've got a drink, do play along. Um, and it's a game called Have You Ever, or also known as Never Have I Ever. But just to keep things simple, Have You Ever. So if you could say yes to the questions, then have a little sip of drink, OK? Um, how do we go? Have you ever Googled a sex position? I'm not going to go yet. <laughs> have you ever Googled a health concern? Have you ever Googled a news story to fact check? Well, if you've answered yes to any of those, you're not alone because everybody goes to Google to nearly everything every day. So the reason why I had the uh, sex position one at the beginning was A, to get your attention, but B, because um, quite a lot of people started Googling the eagle sex position when they were watching Love Island um, a couple of years ago. And it just shows that we always have triggers that are making us go to search all of the time. And that is increasing even more. There's a JP Morgan report at the end of last year um, that went out that shows that we are consuming news and media more than ever at the moment and it is just increasing and rising all of the time um, and because of that we are then trying to form our own opinions as well through news that we might read might not believe all of the facts and uh, things that we read on social media we are constantly triggered to go and search for more so every day three and a half billion searches are happening um, and that's around the world and actually 15% of those each day are new. So if you just try and think about what that really means, it means that we are being triggered by new news all of the time. And so we are going to search to look for more. And the reasons for that can be because A, we are being triggered a lot, but B, Google is quite a private and safe space for people to go and find out more. And whether they're trying to form an opinion based on the things that we are hearing in the media, or we, whether we are worried about something, you can see some of the searches here. Um, this is just a variety, but as you can imagine, around every single topic, there are all sorts of different searches. So the KFC one in the top corner is around whether the vegan burger is actually vegan, because I'm sure you would have heard news around that. Um, health worries, obviously tons of searches around COVID. What you're looking at here is Google Suggests. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of that. But this is audience insight. So Google Suggests is normally the top 10 searches, the most popular searches that are happening in real time at that moment on that particular topic. So it's really, really great audience insight. 
just that alone. So start to think about Google Suggests in a different way and think about it in to do with your, your PR. And the reason why I'm talking about it to you guys who are in PR is because traditional audience research methods do have their place. However, I'm going to put it out there that it can be slightly outdated for the, for the insight that we get from some of these things. Um, and also, I've put old news, fake news, but if we are, so for example, social media monitoring, it definitely does have its place. But we do even subconsciously put a persona of ourselves onto social media. So uh, I've got quoted on another webinar once to saying if we have live our best lives on Instagram or Snap, we definitely live our real lives on Google. And it's because we put in our true worries, thoughts and feelings into Google, which we would never put onto Instagram or Snap, et cetera, et cetera. So we are really diving into the psyche and the thoughts and the feelings of the public by looking at search data. And what I mean by old news with some of the other research methods is that, yeah, they can have their place, but in where we are consuming more and more news and media and that is rapidly increasing, it's definitely not going to slow down. Some of these methods can be, can be um, taking opinions from our audiences and from people that may have changed because our uh, opinions on different topics do change very rapidly right now. So how can we use search insight in PR? Well, you um, just so many different ways, um, but I'm just going to talk through two very quickly. But the, when we use audience insight for PR is used normally at the beginning. So when we are forming a PR strategy and we need to understand the public or our target audience better and form that into a strategy. And it's also afterwards to see if we've actually made a difference. So if our communications have had any impact and whether we've changed opinion, formed opinion or raised more awareness. So this, what you're looking at right now is um, where KFC, it's forking good. Um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, they quite quickly realized they needed to change their um, their slogan of it's finger licking good. Obviously that would be really bad advice right now. And they changed it to forking good and they did a campaign around that. So what you're looking at here is some um, re results from Answer the Public. And Answer the Public uses Google suggests data and massively amplifies it. So you get a whole lot more than just the top 10 that Google will show you. And we give you all of the questions that are being asked around that topic. So you can see here that it's um, there's a lot of people asking questions around the new campaign. So it's proof that the awareness has been raised and people are asking more questions around it, which is great for um, additional PR um, measurements proof. Also, it's a really good tool to be able to um, be monitoring reputation management. Um, this is a story about Boohoo, the fashion online fashion brand, and it was um, last year. But there are still now searches around this this new story happening right now. So, you know, of, of a lot of our time, um, a lot of times we are meant to in reputation management. We think that a story has gone because it's out of the news. But if people are still um, trying to find out if this is going on, then we need to know about it. Um, again, this is data from Answer the Public around Boohoo, and people are still worried about the impact of of that news story. Um, there, there are other ways as well of using this kind of data as preempting a crisis as well, um, where you can put into your, your different brands or different topics that are important to you, and it will track new searches and things like that. For more information on all of that and how you can use search data, um, as I mentioned, Answer the Public is a sort of big amplified source of Google Suggest data um, and if you go to answerpublic.com for public relations, you'll get a lot more information of how you can use it. It is a free tool, but you can also have a paid version for more searches too. That's it. Thanks, Stella. Do you want to um, come off um, presentation and say hello? Thank you very much for that. Uh, responsible for a peak in searches of uh, the equal sex position around. <laughs> around 20 to 2 this afternoon. Someone go and look at Google Trends later. You'll no doubt spot that. Uh, really helpful. Uh, so how would you suggest we use a tool like Answer the Public Search Listening uh, at the outset of a campaign? Um, 
anybody else that's yeah, so, so yeah. no fm i can see the use in an fmc june and consumer to understand behavior you know what about b2b b2b is whatever is the um topic it you can still put it so you can have either brands or issues that might be important to your industry um b2b if you have any kind of financial announcements or uh, any kind of spokespeople that are normally out um, providing comment in the news. You can look at the way that they have been talked about in the past or um, any kind of questions that pop up after an announcement has happened. There's all sorts. I mean, it really isn't sort of vertical specific. It's just everyone searches. Okay, uh, yeah, I definitely got that. There's a there's a great book, isn't there? That, that we both read. Everybody lies um, about exactly this behaviour that you you probably uh, Google is the only person that knows the absolute truth about you um, that even your mother or your partner doesn't know. Uh, so, a couple of questions here, uh, Christopher Lehman. Any advice on using this for uh, smaller publics, geolocation, maybe? Yeah, I mean, if uh, yes, Google suggests is based on. So, as I mentioned, Answer the Public looks um, at the all all questions that are put into Google. Um, where I've been talking about search listening, it's like really similar to social listening, obviously. Um, but I would, I, it's not just Google suggests. Obviously, there's all sorts of um, search data that you can use. Google Trends is really important. I had um, a graph in there that's Google Trends too, um, and as you can imagine, like it, it, Google Trends will only sort of appear um, when there's a lot of a lot of questions that are all peaks and then you get that spike in a graph. But it doesn't mean to say that you have to have millions of people searching for something to be able to look at insight like this. That's why answer something like answer the public is good because it goes into all questions. So it's not just the most popular, but although we do use like a color gradient to show which questions are most popular to um to ones that are, are at least asked um so i think to answer the question when it's something a little bit smaller was it like a smaller topic was that the yeah. question yeah um recommend using answer public there is a free version so you can see all sorts of different questions and just try different um yeah different topics and different words but it's best to keep it um just one phrase or words and then we'll add all of the questions around it uh, to, to talk to us about the 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 grading. You you just mentioned it very briefly there. It says this question from Spencer: Does the platform quantify the the volume of searches uh, in the way people? Sorry, go. On. So we don't have um, actual volumes, i.e. numbers, but we do give you an indication of most popular to least popular. I want to stop saying pop least popular to most popular because sometimes if you're using it on, uh, you're tracking something that's negative to your brand, you don't want it to be sort of popular. So it's the most searches um, to the minimal amount of searches. Uh, so yeah, the, it's a color gradient to give you an idea of more people or less people, um, because you can sort of look over time as well to see whether that's gone up or down. But yeah, we don't use the actual numbers. Um, there are keywords. The reason for that is because we don't want to be, it's not a good idea to be so focused on numbers because there are people that are actually looking at that. And it's not always, you know, if it's something to do with reputation, it could just be one search, you know, that's really important because then that could blow up on social the next day. Um, but if um, the volumes are important to you, there are volume keyword tools um, out there as well. Uh, Keywords the everywhere is a good one to use. Well, uh, but so what's the most extraordinary thing you found out from search listening? what the eagle is <laughs> <laughs> right. okay, so we're no no um, seriously there's um hannah um harris i think she's in in the crowd here she um works at um answer the public and she hosts a monthly webinar on um on search listening and all different areas and she recently did one that was just focused on healthcare. um and it was there was some, i can't remember the exact stats but unbelievable um insight from the way that people are searched are being put straight into NHS and health services and, and vaccinations as well. So it, it is really important. It is more than just me having a fun game on a Friday lunchtime. <laughs> Hannah's, Hannah's just said hello. Hannah, if you, can you pop in the, uh, the URL to your webinars? Um, 
so that uh, she had three, I think almost 3,000 people join yesterday's. So it's a amazing. growing area. Uh, sorry, what was the what was the name of the other tool that you mentioned? I, th I think it's keywords everywhere is a good right. uh, volume, but obviously AdWords is where you actually get volumes from, but you have to actually set up ads now. So for people who don't want the ads, but want the volumes, I have, right. I've, someone's told me that though. I, need, I haven't used that myself. So, but I believe okay. I've heard it's good from a few people. Okay. But you, so you can also go to, yeah, you you can go to, to write to the raw data from Google itself. Yeah. Google AdWords. Uh, we're up on time. Thank you very much. Oh. Really great presentation about search listing and and yeah that book everybody lies I recommend it Steve by Seth Stephen Starovich it's a very very good book um, thank you Stella thank you uh, right so our final speaker for the day is also on digital an aspect of digital PR um, and Garrett do you want to come and say hello I do hello and Garrett, you're supposed to be in Antigua today. I am. I'm, I'm very much not, and it's, it's just started raining, so <laughs> it could not be further away from Antigua, but, you know, still ha happy to be here um, and part of this great lineup. So, let so me... I think we, you first got involved, we first worked together, didn't we, on a, a, a project PR stat where we were trying to characterise yeah. tools in the industry, and you kindly wrote a primer on, on uh, a case study for how to use a particular tool. Yeah. And since then, you've you've risen to uh, well, was it head of client success at Radioactive? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, been there. Well, I've been at the agency now four and a half years. Started as an account director, took the lovely holiday that is maternity leave <laughs> right. um, for eight months, and then came back and I and, and head of client success. So yeah, that, that's where I'm at now. Well, I was hoping you you'd come on to Tina Turner as Tina Turner soundtrack. Oh, but you know what? I I did think about singing the title of the presentation, but I, I, I'm going to save you that. Um, but what I will do is share my screen. Over to you. Hopefully go everyone you. can see that so we can keep everyone on time. So uh, yeah, hello. Thank you for that introduction, Wads. Um, we are talking links today. Um, I'm going to apologize for Tina at the top because we're not, we don't care what Lip's got to do with it. It's all about the links. Um, so kick off with the obvious question. Well, it's kind of just giving me an introduction, but these are some places you can find me. Um, I am Head of Client Success at Radioactive PR, and I've been in PR now for more than a decade, I think we're looking at. Um, I have an agency background, so everything I talk about here, that's what I'm just going to refer to, but the takeaways work for in-house teams just as well. Um, and I'm always up for a chat, so please DM if you've got any questions after this that we don't get to. So why are we talking about this now? Um, you'll likely have seen a surge in digital PR, um, kind of if you're in and around Twitter over the last sort of year, 18 months. There's a multitude of reasons for this. It's not a new tactic, but it's certainly more visible now. Um, I think one of the biggest ones that, that I can see and that we can see at, at Radioactive is that the pandemic has caused a much faster shift in budget allocation than maybe we would have previously seen. Um, I think it was always coming. But I think that the pandemic sped that up. And what that means is that graph you can see on screen um, is from research we did of in-house marketers. Um, we talked, spoke to people at uh, Ben & Jerry's, Paddy Power, um, Acast, um, and they all kind of, kind of shared with us where they saw their spread of budget going over the next sort of three months. And this was back in December. So kind of this first quarter, and I'm sure they're reevaluating now. Um, what you can see here is the biggest share of marketing budgets are going to the things that are really measurable. So your PPCs, your affiliate marketing, your paid social, it's that immediate payback in terms of what you can measure. And digital PR and link building is up in that top five. Lower down, you're seeing things that maybe you would associate with more traditional PR, which is your media relations. But the important thing to think about is where the money's coming from in terms of the internal teams. And we're seeing a split now um, we're talking to marketers in-house, we're talking to people on the SEO teams in-house, and some clients are across a split of both. Um, but links for link strategy, for links for link's sake is not a strategy. And I think that's really important to, to kind of hammer in here. What that means is that we've created this kind of model. So if you're asking yourself traditional or digital PR, you're asking the wrong question, because really they're tactics that speak to a wider goal as a business. 
So just looking at that, what you've got on screen there, you've got your comm strategy um, down the left hand side and more traditional PR tactics that you might use that typically lend themselves to more brand awareness and visibility. And then on the right hand side, you've got your digital PR, which lend themselves to that link building and acquisition. Both of these things, and it's crucial we remember this, both of them lead to increase in organic traffic and revenue. One is just infinitely more immediate and measurable than maybe the, the other has typically been. But what does that mean in real life? Because that's what that's theory. So how are we going to put it into practice? So I want to kind of take you through a campaign we actually ran a couple of years ago. Um, it's one of my favorite ones that we've ever done. It was for a male grooming brand. And it was at a time when we all, I think we all could agree when peak beard was. Um, so the brand was Mobros. They wanted a link building and brand awareness campaign around Christmas, um, which is when both men and women buy their products the most. Uh, so we went with beard stroking. And on paper, that sounds insane, like absolutely insane. What the hell are we thinking? Um, and it was, but I mean, look how happy these people are to be stroking the beards of strangers. Uh, you can't you can't buy pictures like that um, and the results that match were equally as insane so what i want to do now is go back to that model um, and break down this campaign into the way that we had it earlier so from a comm strategy point of view the brand wanted us to increase brand awareness and links to their site so from that if we go down the left hand side again we took the traditional pr route press release media relations I want to point out here this is all very top level stuff it goes into more of it um on that side and on that activity we saw 100 pieces of coverage we had the bbc twice uh metro independent mail online you know all, all your usual suspects and we got broadcast coverage as well and we had the activation the event itself that pop-up where you saw that adorable baby stroking a man's beard uh, we had 100 people book in to be you know, have to be stroking some beards. Um, people stop by on the day and we did get broadcast down to cover it. And we raised a thousand pounds for shelter. Now we could have just stopped there. We could have made this a traditional PR campaign. It didn't necessarily need the digital element, but we added it because the goal was links. So when you look at the digital stuff, uh, on the right, down the, down the side, um, what we did was we forced the link to our on-site content. We call it forcing the link because it means a journalist has to link to your client in order for the story to make sense. They can't cover the story about what you're doing unless the link is there, um, which helped us get 90 plus follow links from the coverage that we got. The way we did that was get ask bearded men to sign up to have their beard stroked. So that was one aspect. And then we asked people to sign up to stroke beards. So those two things forced that link. And then we captured data. What that means is that we saw nearly 6,000 bearded men sign up to get their beard stroked. They probably were very bored at the time. Um, but if we put that another way, that's 6,000 or nearly 6,000 people with beards that have now heard about my male grooming or our male, male grooming product client, provided their email and Mobros can now remarket to them and you know, increase their revenue. It wasn't an initial part of the brief. It was an opportunity we saw down the digital PR tactics that we added later. And both of those things, again, increased organic traffic and revenue. We drove more than 20,000 people to the two pages that we created on site, which was a huge increase in traffic. And if you go to the radioactive blog, there's a whole further blog about this. And there's a graph that shows the spike in traffic, how it compares to their 15 minutes on Dragon's Den a few weeks later. Um, you know, we can't compete with primetime BBC, but I think, you know, have a look at it. It's, in, it's insane that we got anywhere near the sort of traffic and visibility with just this one campaign. So key takeaways then, tactics. If you're not including traditional and digital PR tactics within your strategy, you're likely missing a trick. And we've seen big brands do this. Um, internal data, it's crucial for ideation. And we always start at Radioactive asking, what does the client know that nobody else knows? Um, in this case for Mobros, it was that they were busiest with both genders shopping around Christmas and that they wanted to do something that activated that data. It needs to be relevant. Is your campaign on brand? Traditional, digital, it just needs to be very, very relevant. A journalist won't cover your story as, as good as it might be if they can't see why your client is an authority in that space. And the added value, 
those 6,000 ish, you know, people, what that we, we managed to grab for Mobros, that additional value that keeps, it's the gift that keeps on giving. So if we look at that again, you've got tactics, internal data, needs, relevance, and added value. And we've come full circle because what's Link's got to do with it? Quite a lot. Um, and we've managed to get Tina in there again. Um, so that is, that, that's pretty much me wrapped up. I do have other slides with tools and resources on um, that I will send across to anybody that wants them. I'm not going to talk through them. Because I anticipated the audience today to be more on the traditional side, looking to add digital into the, the things they're already doing, it's very much focused on digital PR resources. If you're a digital PR person who's got maybe an SEO background um, and wants to talk about the more traditional stuff, um, any resources on that side, please, please do get in touch because there's plenty out there. And that's me. Well, Gary, thanks. We've got, do you want to? Um... Well, get out of there. Yes. Want to come back? Hello. Uh, so we've got loads of questions. We've got four minutes, uh, but let's go. Uh, okay. First of all, how do you force a link? Uh, there's a lot of people in the chat room squealed when you said force a link. <laughs> it sounds painful. Um... No, in, in terms of you know, there's been loads of debate, hasn't there, on Twitter about how do you get a how do you get a journalist to put a, a link in? You know, in yeah. a copy PRs repitching the links. Yeah, you've got. <laughs> you've got to add value. You've got to give that journalist a reason to link where otherwise they might not. Um, so there's still the risk and there's a lot of debate. I've seen, it's happened to us in campaigns and I've seen other people talk about it recently um, where a journalist has taken their idea and then written their own piece and not credited. And that's so frustrating, but typically if you give them a reason and that reason can be anything for the beard stroking campaign, that was people need to sign up. There's a call to action, it's super strong. Um, where you might have um, a really great piece of on-site content. It might be some research you've done. It might be internal data. It's, it could be, um, there's a great site called um, the, the Pudding that we use because it's great in data visualization. So that could be the thing that you're forcing the link to. Um, so it, it very much depends. It needs to feel, I mean, at Radioactive PR, we've done this. I mean, Rich and, and when he went to Tanyetti's with Andy, he's been doing this for sort of 10, 20 odd years. And I know there are other people that have, have included digital PR into traditional stuff for, for, for ages, but you can see the shift now where digital PR becomes the main thing. And I think we don't wanna lose all the good stuff that you would typically do in a campaign, but can you add a digital element that's just gonna elevate it and hit those client goals? Cause that's what we're all here for. So, so you made a really compelling case about, uh, and you can see why uh, budgets will be shifting from search agencies to, to uh, PR. Um, the data you presented, a couple of people asked, is that your own data or where's that yes. come from? Second slide. Yeah, so that's, um, that is our own data. Um, we just did a bit of in-house research uh, back in December last year. It's on our blog. Um, like I said, I'm happy to sort of chuck links in at anybody um, if they need them. Uh, I haven't got it to hand right now, but yeah, just on our blog, if you search uh, brand marketers report. Um, uh, Sorry, the Mobro campaign, when you're passing debt, when you're handling as a data provider, how do you manage GDPR? Presumably people have to sign away. Like yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um, it, it's nothing too complicated. This is 2017. I think, yeah, we did the GDPR thing was a, a consideration then. It's just a case of by signing up, you're agreeing to, you know, right. the, some, just some T's and C's and, and yeah, that's how you get around that. Um, a question from Andy Smith. Sorry, though, we're up against time, so I'm bombarding you here. Um, have you any uh, evidence of the relationship or the value of a no follow link compared with a follow link? In oh, that's a whole other presentation. Um, there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of debate around this. I think the, the follow link is the, the golden, the holy grail. That's the thing you're going after. Um, that's the thing that moves the dial the most in terms of SEO. Um, John Mueller, who's search advocate at Google, uh, back in Feb, he actually talked about the, the relevance of links. And actually in Google's core update back in December, they cited the relevance of links as important in ranking. So, so follow, no follow, yes, there's a, de there's a debate to have there. And, and one is certainly more inherently valuable than another. Um, but don't just look at that in isolation. A no-follow link still has value. It will still drive traffic. It will still 
um, you know, it, was, it might still get a key message. It might still get people signing up to that call to action that you put in. So it's not, it's not useless. It's not worthless. Okay, good. Uh, and I just want to, you know, recognize the word the agencies like yourself, you said 10 yet is rise at seven, you know, yeah. uh, yeah. there's clearly a load of energy uh, around this. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Sorry, you weren't in Antigua. <laughs> well, I hope it was worth it. I hope everyone's not like, oh God, I should have got on that plane. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. No, thank you. Thanks for the brilliant presentation. Okay, so I just want to say thank you to everybody for attending. Thanks for taking part. Thanks to David, Corey, Stella, uh, and just that final presentation from Anne Garrett. Um, um thank you to everyone for joining us uh, you're going to receive a sh feedback form shortly uh clearly WodsCon has become a thing we're going to do it again next month in fact we've got a lineup for next month already uh we're going to have uh speakers on creativity purpose uh getting ahead and getting hired in pr and, and storytelling so uh look out for that uh that will also be with the feedback information uh you receive shortly uh we're also looking for people obviously to come and present and pitch um so um we'd welcome uh, we welcome pitches as well uh and with that uh enjoy your weekend thanks for joining us take care and please stay safe